This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome back to Silent Voices. This week we're going to discuss the case of Gert Franken along with her daughter Yasmin. In April 2014, Yasmin was brutally de deported from the Netherlands to her father in Marin County, California. Despite expert evidence of abuse, molestation, and neglect by the father, and despite the fact that he admitted to, in court that he had a severe drug addiction to cocaine and heroin. <clears throat> On today's show, via Google Hangouts from the Netherlands, I'd like to welcome my personal friend, Gert Franken. Thanks for having me on the show today. Gert, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Now, you have prepared a short story of the events that have taken place with your daughter. In a nutshell, can you fill in our viewers on what has taken place in your case? I'd like to read my story. Um, my name is Gerte Franken, and I'm a Dutch citizen and college professor. I'm currently residing in the Netherlands. I lived in the United States from 1988 through 2012, where I also worked as a college professor for about nine years. My daughter Jasmine was born in 2004 in the USA, and she has dual citizenship. The marriage with her father fell apart when she was one years old. Jasmine's primary residency then was with me in Texas, and the father had visitation in California. In 2009, the father admitted to California court that he had relapsed with a severe addiction to heroin and crack cocaine. However, the court ordered Jasmine to visit with her father unsupervised 10 weeks per year. The father failed to pass these court-ordered drug tests, and he skipped the court-ordered drug treatment but the court didn't monitor any of this and they didn't stop the visits. And since the court proceedings had financially depleted me, I could not fight the visitation arrangement. And the court had threatened me that I would lose custody if I did not comply to the visitation. And as such, I followed court orders. However, Jasmine returned from each visit with marked unmanageable behavior. And by the time she was seven, um, she was suicidal despite uh, the fact that she had uh, child therapy. A year later, in 2012, during a family visit to the Netherlands, to which the father had consented, Jasmine told me that her father had been touching her inappropriately during the visits, and that he had been offering white powder to her, and taking her on drug runs, and locking her up, and other stories. And so I uh, notified the Dutch police and um, the Dutch CPS was notified and they referred me to um, psychiatric treatment at a state child's uh, mental health clinic for Jasmine um, so they could deal with her severe depression. She got tested there by a team of experts for a period of about eight or nine months. And uh, those were verbal tests, nonverbal tests and neuro neurological tests and she was also treated there. And they produced a total of about six reports with conclusions of molestation, abuse, and neglect, as well as memory issues due to possible substance abuse. And they ordered an immediate halt to contact between uh, Jasmine and her father. And when I notified the father, he demanded that Jasmine be returned to the USA, and he started a so-called Hague Convention case against me even though the court had stated it was not a case of abduction. In any case, the court in The Hague ordered an independent psychological investigation of Jasmine, and the recommendation to the court by this psychologist was also against any form of contact between Jasmine and her father. 
Jasmine was allowed to testify twice and stated to the court that her father had been abusing and molesting her and that she rather die than ever see him again. This was also confirmed the suicidal and homicidal feelings by the uh, psychiatrist that was seeing her. And the court ignored all of this expert evidence, ignored her testimony, ignored their own uh, psychologist, and they ordered her back to the United States. And then on April 22, 2014, Jasmine was brutally deported to the United States. She was jumped by a SWAT team on her way to school and hauled off kicking, screaming, and vomiting to her father in the States, with whom she had not lived since she was a year old. The case was submit submitted to Dutch Parliament and discussed in Parliament. However, Secretary of State Teve kept his answers classified. Um, Secretary of State Teve has since been fired due to a 5 million euro drug bribe, and he's a witness in the largest pedophile scandal of the Netherlands that also involves ex-chief of Justice Demick. In any case, by granting Marin County Court jurisdiction of Jasmine's case, the Hague Convention judges in the Netherlands broke the Hague Convention Treaty on Article 13, and they violated Jasmine Human's rights. Uh, the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child, Article 3, Article 19, Article 33, 34, 37, and 39. Marin County Super Superior Court Judge Wood then gave the father full custody and threatened me in a back room of the court without a clerk present that if I were to pursue a custody trial that she would make sure I would lose it and that I would never see Jasmine again and she would go after my mother's assets in the Netherlands, even though there are none. And as such, she's in violation to Jasmine's right to a fair trial, which is the UN Treaty and the Rights of the Child, Article 9. In violation of the court's order, the father has ceased contact between Jasmine and me since May 8, 2015, without any explanation. She has been cut off not only from me, but from her entire maternal side of her family, as well as her friends, and obviously she's cut off from her cultural heritage of the Netherlands as well. Local authorities in Marin County in California, including the district attorney and Marin County Sheriff's Office, are not willing to perform mandatory welfare checks. And recently Judge Adams has ruled that she allows the father to get away with breaking her own court orders, and she's not willing to investigate the matter through a so-called 311 child sexual abuse investigation. And she's also not willing to drug test the father. She's not facilitating contact between my daughter and me. And she's not allowing me to know where my daughter lives either. And according to the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child, Article 10, Jasmine has the right to be safe and have contact with me at all times. And withholding Jasmine's location from me is also in vi a violation of this treaty in Article 9. And you can read the entire story on uh, www.freejasmine.com. And it's spelled in our Dutch name like this. So your viewers can take a look and read the story on the website. Um, it also contains evidence. Now you've given us the short version. As I read your longer version, I was in complete shock. Now your ex admitted in court to severe addiction to heroin and crack, and the courts kept visitation intact. Your daughter comes back from the visits more and more depressed each time and starts sharing stories with you about school. What, what was she telling you about the abuse? And how did your daughter handle this? Yeah, those first three years from age four to age seven, when she visited with her dad, she told me her dad was making her do things she didn't want to do, like force her to walk along a steep cliff. Um, she said he would get angry and lock her up in the house for an extended amount of time. He locked her up in the closet, um, offer her white powder, take her on drug runs. And when she'd come back from those visits, she would throw severe tantrums and not just kicking and screaming, but also biting herself and biting me. She would bang her head against the wall almost to the point of bleeding. 
she wanted to have the lights on all day long in the middle of the day. She never wanted to be alone. Uh, I'd even have to accompany her to the bathroom. She would follow me like a little puppy dog uh, all around the house, even when I put the trash out at the curb, stuff like that. And her behavior also became increasingly less authentic, like she was acting or something. And this went on for about two years. And then at seven years old, after coming back from the visit with her father, she handed me a large kitchen knife and asked me to end her life. Um, she was in child therapy for all of this. It did ease the symptoms somewhat. But uh, it wasn't until she was eight years old during a visit to my family in the Netherlands when she'd just gotten back from a visit with her dad that she told me that uh, he had been touching her in the private parts, as she called it. And um, yeah, that's, that's when I contacted the police. Of course you contacted the police, didn't you? Yes, I contacted the police and they referred me to uh, Child Protective Services. And then Child Protective Services referred us to uh, state child mental health clinic so jasmine could get help with the severe depression and that clinic then tested and treated her with a psychiatrist a neurologist and three psychologists for a period of about nine months or so and that uh, team concluded in six extensive reports that she had indeed been molested and abused and neglected by her father and that she had symptoms of um, dissociative identity disorder as a result Okay, so you confronted your ex with these allegations, correct? And also started the proceedings with the International Court in The Hague? Yes, he demanded she return to the States. Uh, I couldn't though. I had already been through several court proceedings with him two years prior to that when he had admitted to the court that he had relapsed with heroin and crack cocaine. He had accused, accused me of uh, parental alienation syndrome and was trying to get custody of Jasmine and fighting all of that cost me about $60,000 and I didn't have the money to take on more court cases to fight the visitation. So the case was handled in The Hague as a child abduction case even though it wasn't and the judges admitted that it wasn't because he had given us permission to go to the Netherlands. But yeah, the court uh, ordered their own psychological evaluation of Jasmine and um, that psychologist also uh, told the court that there should not be any type of contact between Jasmine and her father, not even supervised. And Jasmine testified about the abuse in the molestation, but she was still ordered to go back to the States. And in appeal, she testified about the abuse and molestation again. But uh, the Hay Court didn't care, and they didn't look at the expert evidence whatsoever. Now, the Hay Convention on Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction, Article 1.3, as determined by the Hay Convention, states that when a child expresses strong resistance and or if a child is in danger when returned, the child does not have to go back. So judges broke their own treaty. Is that accurate? Yes, to top things off, they demanded that I leave the Netherlands and I do not hold citizenship in any other country than the Netherlands. And by that time, uh, I had no more green card. It was expired. So where was I supposed to go? And as it turns out, um, the Dutch International Court at The Hague hardly ever allows children to stay, no matter what they face upon return. Only like 1% of children is allowed to stay. And the numbers are that every other day a child gets deported from the Netherlands and the primary caregiving parent, which is usually the protective parent, can often not accompany them. And so the mother-child bond gets severed. And uh, by allowing this to happen and ordering such, uh, such court orders, the Hague Court is in violation with the UN International Treaty and, and has been for years and uh, formal complaints with the UN about this non-compliance have been filed, uh, not only by myself, but also in unison with other affected parents. And they gave you 72 hours to return Yasmin. Now your ex was over there going to all the schools, looking for her. You quit your job, packed the camping gear, and went on the run for eight months. 
But that turned out to be impossible, so you returned to the Netherlands and put her back in school. Then after a few months, they found her? Yes, we had just left the house in the morning to go to school when we were jumped from the bushes by an entire SWAT team in black combat gear. And the neighbors witnessed everything. And Jasmine was hauled off, kicking and screaming. And she was dragged into a car with tinted windows. She was not allowed to say goodbye to me or take any of her personal belongings. All she had was her school bag and her favorite teddy bear. And later I heard that she vomited in the car on the way to the airport. And I was thrown in jail for six hours without being allowed to talk to my attorney. So they were able to sneak Jasmine out of the country. And my constitutional rights were broken that way because according to the law, I should have been given the chance to stop the deportation through summary proceedings. Now, as far as you know, Yasmin is, Fair, is in Fairfax, California. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, after the deportation, my ex was given full custody and I tried to fight it. Um, but Judge Woods uh, of Marin County, California told me that if I were to start that custody trial, she'd make sure I'd never see my daughter again and she'd go after assets of my family that aren't even there. And I did not sign any agreements, but they filed this as a court order anyway. And my lawyer quit on me when I told her I didn't want to sign it. And then I tried for a year to get a lawyer, but no one was willing to take my case pro bono. And my ex has cut off all contact between me and Jasmine since May 2015. He chases every willing supervisor away. And I appeared pro se, uh, meaning without a lawyer in custody review hearing two months ago. And then Judge Adams said that she talked to Jasmine, but there is no digital audio recording of that. So what was ever said, we don't really know. And Judge Adams is letting my ex get away with breaking all of her court orders. She's not facilitating contact between me and my daughter, and she's not even willing to let me know where, where my daughter lives. I have not had a sign of life since May two, 2015. And I don't know um, really from day to day whether she's still alive. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous. I've, I've raised my daughter as a single mom for 10 years and she just gets ripped away from me like this. Um, I need a pro bono lawyer who has a heart who's willing to appeal this. Yeah, so um, I've been fighting um, the way Jasmine was deported by taking the case to court. And uh, I lost that case and it was appealed and I lost that as well. Um, and then I've approached a child ombudsman here in the Netherlands. And um, he is the person that is the go-between between citizens and government or the citizens and the justice department. And he agrees with me that uh, what has happened to Jasmine, not just the, the ruling of the Hague Court, but also the manner in which she was supported, um, goes against her uh, human rights. Um, so he's going to be handling uh, that aspect uh, here in the Netherlands. Um, I have proposed several changes to laws and regulations here in the Netherlands to make sure that um, not only uh, um, these child deportations through the Hague courts are stopped, um, we cannot have these judges apply the Hague Convention Treaty without applying Article 13. If you strip the treaty of Article 13, it basically becomes a deportation law. And so um, this is something I'm fighting for uh, also on behalf of all future children who are in Jasmine's situation so that they never have to go through this in the future. Um, and of course, uh, the same goes for the protective mothers. I would never uh, wish anyone to go through what Jasmine and I have gone through. So I'm trying to fight that. And I've also suggested solutions to Jasmine's situation in the United States. Um, and the child ombudsman, Mark Dellart, has been interested uh, and very positive uh, in his response to those solutions that I have suggested. 
Um, I cannot make those particular suggestions public at this time, though. I am so sorry to hear the shocking story, and I will certainly be praying for you that you get your daughter back home where she belongs. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing your story. Well, on behalf of my daughter, Jasmine, and all other court abducted kids all over the world, I want to thank you for having me on today. You can read the entire story and view the evidence at www.freeyasmine.com. Again, that's www.freeyasmine.com. We'll be back right after these messages. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Good evening, and welcome to Parenting Class. I'm your instructor, Zippy the Hippie. Tonight we're going to discuss how to file a child welfare grievance. When you're dealing with the child welfare system, things do not always go the way you expect them to be. There is a way to let others know what is going on. It is called the grievance. Different from a complaint, the grievance is a tool to inform your elected and appointed governmental officials that they need be aware of how you, as a constituent, need assistance in addressing a problem. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution Bill of Rights states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You are creating a legal and historical document so make sure you put your name, legal address, phone number, email address, and most of all, the date. Since a grievance is a governmental communication, which is a public document, and to make the entire process more streamlined, you can write a simple greeting like dear sirs and madams, or to whom it may concern. Then, in less than two sentences, state why you are filing a formal grievance. The purpose of a grievance is to solve the problem. No one wants to listen to emotional cries or religious fervor, because it only takes away from the legitimacy of the grievance. A grievance is a professional request for intervention, not a 12-step program. So do not tell your life story because no one wants to hear it. In less than one sentence, state the date the incident occurred because it is best to solve one issue at a time. If this means writing 1,000 complaints, then it means writing 1,000 complaints, and keeping a record of each one. Start the sentence with words like, on or about. If you can give a time of day, like sometime around 6 in the evening it gives more clarity to the situations of public administration, meaning the individuals receiving the grievance will be better able to investigate the people and places involved. Then in less than one sentence, state what it is that is wrong. Make sure you have tried to settle the matter by filing internal complaints with the board of directors or director and supervisors of the child welfare agency. List the names and dates of meetings or phone calls you've made to attempt to resolve the issue. This is the important part, you have to tell them what you want. Clearly, state what it is that will rectify the reason for the grievance. Do not ask for money because you just won't get it. Bullet point if you have to. Enumeration is even better. In closing the letter, you have to give respect to the person reading your grievance or, guess what, they may not hear your grievance. Feel free to express your emotion in one to eight words, like, with all love for my children. Although there is nothing wrong with sticking to the traditional sincerely or a thank you. Sign your name. Take the time to transmit your feelings and desires in the signature. Express yourself. Believe it or not, many people can tell much of a person by looking at the signature. This is one of my favorite parts of the grievance. I like to make sure everyone is invited to the party. First go to www.legallykidnapped.blogspot.com and click on the LK Help Desk link in the sidebar. Then scroll down to the bottom and start listing the federal contacts. 
You do not need to have the address, but include the name and title. Putting the federal contacts first creates a sense of power in your grievance. Next click on your state. Here you will find the contacts for your elected and appointed officials. Make sure to list each one with name and title. If you are in the mood, you can also alphabetize each person according to last name, but it really does not matter. Do not forget to include the names of the board of directors of the child welfare agency, director, and above all the social worker. Print enough copies for every person you have CCD, and include two copies for your personal files. Personally sign each grievance. When you address each envelope, make sure your return address is at the top left. The purpose of what is called hard copy mailing is because you are creating a historic, federal document. When the post office stamps the letter, it is a form of effectuating service, just a fancy term of the formal delivery of the grievance. You will mail one extra copy to yourself and another one to someone you trust and with authority, like your priest or someone in an organization. Ask the person you send the extra copy to never, and I repeat, never open the grievance because it can be used as a legal document in a court of law. When you receive yours, do not open it because it can be used in the event something goes wrong with the letter you're sent to your trusted person. As you have now generated a public, historic, federal document, you are now ready for publication. If you have placed the names of your children, take a black magic marker and black out the names. This is called redaction because your children, if it has escalated to this level, are wards, whether they be wards of the state or wards of the court, you must protect your children's privacy and future privacy. If you are not comfortable with your personal information being out there on the internet, I suggest you black that out, too. Then, send the blacked out copy to sites like Legally Kidnapped for publication. This is simply a peaceable assembly of our voices. Normally, you should give anyone responding to a grievance 10 business days, only count Monday through Friday. If you have not had a response, then send a second copy of the grievance, and make sure you put in big red letters across the top. Second copy. Keep a file of all documents. Keep a log or even a diary of every date, time, place and person of contact during all dealings with the child welfare system. Two, repeat the above process until you get what you want, and that is your kids. Always remember, get the kids first, get the attorney second, and stay informed by following www.legallykidnapped.blogspot.com every day. Thank you, and have a good night. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us same time, same channel next week. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make a difference. difference.